Okay. They are the power couple of digital and influencer marketing and coined the term human to human. Brian Kramer and Courtney Smith Kramer co-own H2H companies in the Silicon Valley marketing agency, Pure Matter. They are movers and shakers in the digital hemisphere, and they are the best private coaches you could ever have. They have been knighted with numerous awards and accolades, but perhaps the coolest honor of all was getting a picture taken with Grumpy Cat. <laughs> oh. Welcome to the dynamic duel of all things digital, Brian and Courtney. So glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us, Deb. Thank you. <laughs> so first, I have to ask you, how did the two of you meet? Uh, we met, uh, well, we could say that we met at a bar in Washington, D.C. That would be true. Uh, which would be true, but we actually were at a conference, and it was the National Advertising uh, Federation, um, American Advertising Federation, and um, uh, there's two sides to every story, so it depends who you ask which <laughs> side you're going to get which story, but, I, uh, <clears throat> you know. I, I feel like it's a... What a great example of like the sliding door moment. You know what that is? You see that movie sliding doors of like, what were the conditions that needed to happen for our paths to cross? <laughs> and who did we have to meet in the days before in order to be in proximity with each other? So it was serendipity, as they say. Mm. And being in a relationship is hard enough, but what's the secret for running a business together and staying married? <laughs> Tequila. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Sense of humor, mutual respect, and a shared vision. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Brian? those are good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, I think, um, you know, along the very first night that we opened up our business we were talking about business in uh not to get not to get crass but we were, we were talking about business in bed um, <laughs> and we were we were really excited about it and so all we were doing is just talking about <laughs> what if we did this and what if we did that what if we did this and all of a sudden it dawned on us about what we were talking about where we were talking about it and how much we were talking about it and it was just our first night and so um, this was 20 some years ago mm -hmm. and we just decided, is this how it's going to be? And how are we going to be in our relationship? And we just decided, you know what, if it's fun and we're, yeah. and it's joyful, then just throw caution to the wind and enjoy the conversation wherever it happens. And if it's not, then let's not have it. And so that's kind of what we've yeah. lived by is just have the conversation in our marriage, wherever it feels fun. Yeah. Still happens yeah. nightly, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's we awesome. get about 20 minutes into a show and then we have to pause it because then there's two hours of conversation after that. <laughs> <laughs> and you do a lot together. <laughs> <laughs> so how difficult were those early years? Because, mm -hmm. you know, most of us come from humble beginnings when we're starting our business. And when did everything change for you? Hmm. Oh, well, well, that that that's an assumption that things have changed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> not that they haven't, they certainly evolved, but uh, early days. Yeah, it's there's always good days, bad days, good moments, bad moments, mediocre moments through through everything. Um, I'll tell you, when we first started our business together, which was mm, about a year after we met year, I don't even know where we married yet. <clears throat> um, which we started it out of our house that was on a wing and a prayer, you know, like self-funded using our own credit cards to try to get it off the ground. And we rented our first space without any clients, like no joke, wing and a prayer. And wow. we were like, just signed the lease in this cute little Victorian right in downtown San Jose and uh, just went for it. It's like we're we know we're gonna make this happen. We had confidence in that. It just was a matter of finding people who uh, who would sign up for it, and thankfully they did, mm -hmm. <laughs> and still are. <laughs> yeah, that that would be scary as hell. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. Leap of faith. Yeah. I think when we knew was when we had a team of people who we believed in and when uh, they believed in us. Um, it was about the clients. And, and when we started to get uh, clients that were, um, which, which is a whole nother story into itself. Um, but we, when we got clients like, like uh, Netflix um, DVD and mm-hmm. MasterCard and Cisco and IBM and Plantronics. Uh, I mean, and just companies that we never thought in a million years that would, would be like, you know, the local, not the, not the, actually, I really enjoyed our local clients just as much mm-hmm. now looking back, like our accounting firms and our construction companies. Hair salons. And, yeah. Like Aveda <laughs> and like, but, but when we, when we got up into the um, top fortune 100 mm-hmm. companies, it really sparked a, wow, we, we really, we really got there. We're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other side of it is you have so much now. How do you juggle it? <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's the pivot, right, that we made um, I, back in 2016, which was we were experiencing our own burnout in our business and um, decided that it's a lot of responsibility to have a lot of employees. You know, it like it the mental space that that was having on us, knowing that we had to service enough business in order to pay their salaries and their health care. And and we cared about them and their families, of course. And so we decided um, that we just needed to make a shift. So we um, uh, changed into a contractor model and it changed our world because that opened up the space for us to take on the business and then scale quickly if we needed to. And then also allowed Brian Um, and you can speak to this, but, um, he always wanted to be a a coach and more about business and leadership as opposed to just agency world marketing and sales, which he also knows a lot about, but, um, he, he's an amazing coach as you know. (laughs) So learned a lot about the business and, um, how to build a business. Cause at that point we're like, wow, we, we have gotten the processes and the workflows and everything down to be super efficient and productive um, with the infrastructure, but it was our, uh, time for our mental health to be serviced as well, (laughs) to be more on purpose. And it's a hell of a lot easier tax wise. If you use contractors and go through, uh, uh, payroll. Yeah. 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 At a certain point it, um, I wish I could say that was the reason because we loved a lot of the people that we had. We got totally, we, we, we really, I miss a lot of people that being around them. I don't mm-hmm. think that was the top of mind reason. Cause we we're up to 30 people at one point. Um, and to go back on, on that, just for that reason, probably wouldn't, wouldn't be the only reason, but it's a huge benefit to your point. Um, I mean, healthcare alone was probably <laughs> like a, a huge reason probably unto itself, but that wasn't the, the only reason. Um, I think the biggest reason is that we we became our own case study for what uh, business owners hmm. need to do yeah. better in the world. And and um, you know I've told this story before, but um, you know we 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 were running ourselves ragged um, on the outside looking in. We were doing um, to to what everybody thought we were doing very well, and we were. Um, we were doing well. Um, we were, we had all these great clients. We were doing great work. We were winning awards. Yeah. Court, Courtney's team was doing, doing great creative. Um, and, um, and I was speaking over 200 days a year. I was on the road 200 days a year, which now when you think about the adverse effects of all of that, <laughs> we were working our butts off. Yeah. And, um, and to my son's point, when I came home one day, and he was 11. Who are you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he came, he pulled me aside into his bedroom by the hand and, and, and he said, dad, you're never home. You have, you've, you're fat. He, he's, he's honest. And I, I <laughs> ate my way through every country. So to his point, I really did. I mean, the food was good. Um, and you know, I got <laughs> diabetes because of that, which is in my family, but I, I gained, you know, over 85 pounds and, um, and then uh, it just put a ton of pressure on my family because he said, you are never see our games. You never see my sister's games, like all this stuff. And so next day I was, I came back uh, from a trip and, and, uh, and I said to Courtney, we're going to have to re yeah. retool everything to 
fit a better lifestyle than what's going on here. So we restructured processes and systems and everything just to really understand what a better lifestyle of work is. And, um, and then made it go at that and finally exited everything so that it was done properly and, and then, or as good as we could make it and then, um, re retooled a better life. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's, that's basically why we did it is because I never wanted to miss a game again. I lost 85 pounds. I lost diabetes and I took my health back and took, took, we took our lives back. Yeah. Mm. Was that your, that had to been your worst moment, right? During your early, early days. Well, I'm, was I, mean, it? I would say <clears throat> the moment it was, it was leading up to uh, the reason. Um, yeah. There were lots of, lots of moments where I, um, probably, you know, I put on the 85 pounds because internally I was, you know, Not heavy. heavy. So I would say that that was maybe my best moment because I finally took control. <laughs> Isn't every worst moment your best moment? Yeah, it is. Yes. And, and you taught that and we're going to get to that. <laughs> um, so there is no better school than hard knocks. And, mm -hmm. uh, so did you ever have a moment where you thought about getting out of the business and just getting a job? Yeah. Well, I kind of, that kind of did happen for me anyway. Which don't was, we think about that every day sometimes? Oh, I mean, well, because, because that's the, 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 the default conversation that happens when you're like, Oh my God, I don't really know what to do next. People are like, Oh, well, why don't you just go get a job? And for, serial entrepreneurs like us, that's the worst thing possible, <laughs> yeah. right? Like I, we always called it, I will never go to the dark side. <laughs> Explain never... why that is, because a lot of people don't understand. They think that, you know, just get a job, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think um, for those who value certainty, <laughs> then getting a job is the way to go. For, um, entrepreneurs require, um, a, a very high level of comfortability with uncertainty and uh, freedom, right? Like this is why we get into business for ourselves is to have the freedom to do what we want when we want it and work with the people who we want to work with. And uh, that's what we're used to as, as business owners. And um, you know, for uh, the, the role that I accidentally stepped into at my time at um, the coactive training Institute was um, getting hired as a contractor to help them with their new positioning as they made the transition from coaches training institute to coactive and then um, stepping into a role to fill a, 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 a sudden void that happened as a result of a family uh, tragedy of the people that I was working with in the marketing department. So they had to leave to pay attention to that, obviously, and rightly. And um, so I stuck around, <laughs> like, I'm just going to stay until someone kicks me out because we have already done so much work. And if everyone's okay with it, I'm just going to stay here. And I ended up being there for almost four years. So <laughs> I, I did have, um, you know, the opportunity to be in that brand side uh, experience, which I am so grateful for because it gave me so much more insight into what our clients are going through. Uh, on the brand side now, as we're, you know, coaching and consulting people um, continually through their leadership and business and, you know, marketing and creativity on, for me. And it, it created a lot of empathy um, on for me anyway, to get that new perspective of what are people dealing with the additional layers that they're not necessarily dealing with in a remote, you know, consulting business like ours. So you've, and, and it's been a long time since you've been to the dark side. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good but one. I'm back and we're, we're all still friends over there. And the time that, that I slash we spent at CTI was life-changing. So highly recommend anyone that's looking to have their, their brains reprogrammed into what it means to be a leader and taking responsibility for your actions and, um, I highly recommend CTI. Tell them I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> or Brian and Courtney Kramer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, now you guide others out of the abyss. How can people turn their vulnerabilities into a strength? 
you kind of described a little bit of it, but. Oh, wow. That's like a Brene Brown question. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I'm tingling. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned H to H in, in the intro, the human to human H to H, which is um, a, a movement <laughs> that <laughs> he started. Um, well, see, he, we started seemingly overnight success ish. Uh, in 2014, but in reality, we've been saying uh, for since we've been in business together that there really is no such thing as B2B or B2C. It's H to H, human to human, because that's how we appeal. And we're about relationships, not transactions, which is how B2B or B2C frames the, the market. And um, relationships matter, right? So um, you ask about vulnerability, and one of the pillars of H to H that we focus on is imperfection. The other two are simplicity and empathy, which are the three things that we've identified as the, the traits that make us the most human versus any other machines out there, AI or whatever. Um, and so the imperfection piece of it is the vulnerability piece of it, right? Which is uh, when, you, when you can identify what makes you imperfect as a human being and celebrate it, it becomes your superpower if you're able to be open and vulnerable to share with others, because it's the thing that makes us relatable to other human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, it's funny because when you look at imperfection and you, you think, well, you know, what is, what does it mean to be imperfect? Um, and, and how as a company are we going to be, uh, celebrating imperfect imperfection? Um, you know, it happens every day. You don't have to try it you just are it. Uh, there's no such, such thing as perfection. So yeah. uh, it, watch for it. It'll happen. Um, and, and when you see it, then embrace it, embrace the imperfection. The other thing is when you look at brands, um, you can see the brands that actually are proactive about their imperfection. So you can see it like in Dove, uh, who celebrates the imperfection mm -hmm. of skin, um, or mm -hmm. other brands that, that, uh, are nonprofits or, um, or even uh, travel companies, some of them who just make fun of themselves, like, well, we missed that one, um, you know, especially at a time when travel is, is more than imperfect. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, there's, there's no, like I said at the beginning, there's no such thing as imperfect. And based upon what Courtney said, the vulnerability factor is how you respond to imperfection. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you match those two up together, you've now got the perfect winning combination for any human or brand. Ooh, that's a paradox. There's perfection and <laughs> <in> being imperfect. <laughs> you know, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> so how does sharing your vulnerabilities also help you through your healing process? I, saying it out loud <laughs> is a good start. Uh, when you, when you share what your imperfections are with people and, um, put yourself in that vulnerable place, that's leading with your heart. And that's how you do connect with other human beings. It, it, that's where the empathy piece comes in, which is we have empathy for other people who are exercising their own vulnerability in that moment and modeling it for other people, um, to be more vulnerable because it does create that space of empathy and compassion, which is what we're desperately needing <laughs> in many societies today. And uh, I don't know. What do you think? I think people want to do business with others that they identify with. Yeah. Um, not that they, not with people they don't identify with. Um, you know, uh, when you look at, um, we're talking off offline um, or off camera, but when we were talking about Zelensky, we we're, we're talking about like this uh, humorous family driven um, sensitive, uh, like I said, uh, very, very vulnerable, uh, man. And mm -hmm. we see into and have intimacy with his family and what he stands for. And we see us in him and, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and we identify with him more so. And, and it's not just what he's doing now, but it's what we stand for or what we know is like that, that could have been us. Like we, we feel us in him and his family and what he stands for, because that just is like a red, a readily everyday kind of family, if you will. 
Um, and, and so that's vulnerability to me. Um, that's the same thing in business. Um, when you look at people who know that they can, they can cast away and be and share certain things, not everything about them, but, you know, 60, 70% enough that, you know, you can, you can lower the, lower the, the curtain and say like, this is, this is me. And now we have something to talk about. And then now business is just easier um, to have happen between us. Um, that's where, that's where the magic happens. Mm. Well, and, and to your point about Zelensky, he's leading with his heart, which is courageous. He's modeling leadership and showing us that vulnerability is a leadership skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's, he's, <laughs> he's not letting anybody tell him what to do. Well, I, I, I make up that he has his, his tight circle that he has let in and is in conversation and relationship about what to do next and agile in just dealing with what's here now instead of trying to force his hand and make things happen like is what is happening to him right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's, it, it is being in that relationship and that situation with humility and heart and uh, conversation, you know, and he's sharing it with his people. Uh, that is the one yeah. thing that is different about him and that leadership. And actually, if you even go across the corporate world, uh, when you've got a leader that communicates that way and on, on the platforms that people are, that the people are at, he's not holding a press conference and mm -hmm. doing it across mainstream media or the masses. He's doing it via uh, Instagram. He's doing it TikTok. He's doing it in intimate uh, media where it actually connects directly to his people. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, how many and, corporate leaders do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian mentioned intimacy, which is another way to think about that is into me, you see, and sharing on those platforms, being his, his full self and creating a, a space where he he's, he's, he's okay with saying, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen next. I just know that we're here for it and we're not going to give up like that. That's inspiring. That's the transparency that you're talking about, which is lacking in a lot of corporate environments and the transparency element and being able to say, I I'm here, I'm here for you. I I'm not, we're not going to give up, but full transparency, I actually don't know what to do in this moment, but we're going to work it out <laughs> is that takes a lot of courage and is another example of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So what has surprised you at how people connect with your message? Um, I'm surprised they they um, connected with it this long. Um, mm. I I'm I was I was excited the fact that that it connected in the first 48 hours the way that it did. Um, there was over 124 million impressions in in that time frame, and that's when we knew that uh, you know, and a friend of ours uh, encouraged encouraged us to take all the work that had written for the last two years. And Courtney, that's why I say. It was a team effort because Courtney helped to uh, stitch together all the writing that I've done um, into the book that was written in five days. This one. Um, <laughs> and self-published uh, because there were so many people coming into in, into um, our inboxes, our social inboxes, the perver proverbial inboxes across social media. And um, and we had to we felt like we needed to answer what what it meant then, which was different than it is now, by mm -hmm. the way. Um, it's changed. Um, and, and it's not that long ago. It was only like six years ago. 2014. Um, oh, that's eight years ago. Eight years ago. Wow. wow. I haven't done the math. That flies. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh my God. I, I need to adjust my internal time clock. Um, <laughs> it's so, okay. The pandemic doesn't count. Those two years lasted 50 years. <laughs> um, you know, and what, one thing that hasn't changed is um, social media isn't that old. Mm -hmm. um, it's still within the last decade that it became mainstream. And, um, and that's what it really was about. It, it was about how uh, social media brought us closer together and it created a two-way conversation anywhere in the world. That's what it was meant 
to originally talk about and where company companies were had a one way direction where Mad Men days of you know TV commercials and radio were only the way that you had options to advertise and uh, and and consumers could not talk back. Um, mm-hmm. That was the way that they did things, and now all of a sudden, um, what what we now call table stakes then was not, and so now you know eight years ago or even 10 years ago, um, everyone could talk back. And what did this mean for companies? Companies had to figure out what, what was their response if they got a bad reply or, or, or bad support. And it was public. It was global. Quite frankly, this is still an issue today. They, they yeah. still don't quite know what to do. Um, even though it is table stakes, it's still a problem. Um, however, most of them have it mostly figured out, not all the way. <laughs> and and um, it's it's now a totally different problem. It's human to technology to human. And over the past um, uh, two years in the pandemic, because we had connection taken away from all of us, um, which is the number one reason for why why humans exist. And so when we um, when we now at this point, it's it's a whole different ball game um, for what we desire, what we want out of human to human which is a whole nother question, a whole nother answer. I'll stay away from that, but that's, um, you know, augmented reality and, and, you know, mm-hmm. zoom and, um, and automation and email and, and how do you stand out and how being human is now your competitive advantage yeah. to everything else that exists out there. Yeah. And, and I would say it's kind of at the core always been about humans relationship with technology and, and the, uh, the evolution of that, because back in 2014, it, People were like, oh my gosh, AI was just starting to come on and people were scared that robots were going to take their jobs. And it was especially amplified here in Silicon Valley where we live. And uh, so it was a nice, uh, interesting story to tell, right? About what Brian just said is being human is your competitive advantage. No, uh, humor is another facet of of why human beings have a competitive advantage over over technology. But like Brian mentioned over time, um, it has evolved and I love... um, the the uh, even the evolution of the word imperfect is interesting right because what was imperfect just five years ago if you remember that uh the clip that went viral of that bbc reporter who was on in his home office and then his kids came in oh yeah and like the nanny came scurrying in on her hands and that's the norm (laughs) right and that went bonkers on youtube it has like 80 million views or something and it's still you know like a thing, it went viral. Well, now at post pandemic, that's a Tuesday, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> yeah. every, everyone's used to, that's been normalized now. So the definition of what imperfect was from our own human perspective has shifted, which is another um, contextual thing, right? Human beings have the ability to put concepts and, and meanings in context, which is also another thing that a, that a machine just can't do, not yet anyway. Not yet. So when you look at the conferences, uh, especially in the early days, it'll be, I'll be politically correct here. It it is a certain demographic who are invited as speakers and has evolved a little bit. But when I look on Twitter and I look on the digital and TikTok and other platforms, the diversity is quite great, or maybe it's just the people that I follow, but there are a lot of, people in the digital hemisphere who are quite diverse, but they're still not getting invited to these conferences to speak. Mm. Is it the conference organizers that have to kind of change their outlook? I think of the, you know, when I'm thinking of that, it kind of reminding me right now of the Oscars, (laughs) Mm. but do, do the conference organizers have to, start looking at themselves and start taking an effort to invite more diversity into their conferences or Mm -hmm. do you think it'll ever change? Uh, I think it's both. Both. Yes. Yes. And I think it will change. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. Uh, Well, diversity is um, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a good one that there's um I think that it depends on the person who's running the conference, mm-hmm. but quite, quite frankly, it comes down to 
to how much that person is sticking to their guns of making sure that there is diversity and what does that mean for the team as they're onboarding and um and then you know just the importance factor so i would put it back on each conference and say who who is that i've been invited to uh conferences that i've turned down because it was all male um panels um and it just you know wasn't worth doing that that looked look horrible and not just looked horrible, but it was horrible um, for them and for everyone. So it just was not worth anybody doing that kind of stuff. So, I mean, how far have we come to not see that that's not right? Um, you know, so uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's up to the person though, the curator, if you will, or the, or the conference owner, it usually comes down to the conference owner uh, managing the curator because that that's where the buck stops and they've got to, they've got to make the change at the top and say, yeah. this is how we're going to be. I, I, I don't know, um, if it'll change in this, in this decade, decade, to be honest with you, I think it needs to roll through another, um, another, um, uh, uh, one more decade to get through mm, another, yeah. uh, because I think that it's still a generational thing. Um, unfortunately, I hate saying that out loud. Um, I think there may be a younger generation starting to roll in that is, you are seeing that in certain conferences and maybe you're seeing some people that are a little more cognizant of it. And so I'm seeing conferences that do have that, um, but it's just not widespread enough. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. that's, that's where I'll leave that. Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, you're right. And, and of course, the power of those diverse communities is so huge. I don't understand why they don't see it because I mean, just going back to a few years ago, remember that um, rally that 45 had planned and all the TikTok army and mm -hmm. K-pop uh, army uh, basically took it over and bought all the tickets and then mm -hmm. nobody showed. I mean, the po that is so polarizing and that literally happened overnight. In fact, a friend yeah. of mine, her, her daughter, uh, her daughter uh, bought a ticket to that. <laughs> and well, what, what a up. cool example though, of how like Gen Z knows how to mobilize social media to make movement. And that's yeah. because they're the first fully social media like social natives, you know, like we would call, we're not even digital natives. That would be like maybe millennials are digital natives, but I'd say Gen Z are social natives, right? Where they, they understand the power of the platform and how to, how to use it um, to make their voice heard as a collective. And we know that uh, the human race is imperfect, but what is it about the brands that are so afraid to show their human side? Uh, they hide behind their corporate messaging and they still do it. It's, it's, it seems like the rare brand that, I mean, we talked a little bit about it, but it, it seems like the rare brand that doesn't. So when you have, but there's a lot of people like you, there's a lot of people I know who are in public relations and, and guiding some of these people probably to be more human there, are they just ignoring the message and just going with what they know? Um, yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's somebody that I would acknowledge whether you like the person or not for saying uh, something that I'm sure his PR firm is constantly saying, please stop. And he doesn't care. And that's Elon Musk. Yes. Um, he, he is probably his PR firm's worst nightmare. <laughs> um, and he will go on and tweet to his heart's delight, whatever the heck he thinks. Now, I'm sure that there's some rhyme and reason behind certain things because he's a little bit, um, you know, uh, uh, practiced. And so he knows what he's doing. Uh, however, there's no way that some of those tweets are that planned. And so I think that it's a really good uh thing and you know it's funny that now that you call that human and now the fcc is after him because he's mm -hmm. he's jeopardizing the 
um, he's jeopardizing stock the stock market because he's, you know, saying things that might jeopardize the stock price of his company um, when all he's doing is being human about uh, what he says. And so that what they're saying is you need to be more rehearsed and practiced and put out things that are, you know, in line, which I think is just ludicrous. So, um, you know, that that's the kind of stuff that I think is really interesting. I, I find uh, customer support situations the most fascinating. And that, that to me is also H to H. When you look at mm-hmm. H to H, it's not just what lives out outside of the company. It's what lives between the customer and the company, yeah. which is, which is a lot of times what happens when you go to return a product or when you, excuse me, when you have a, um, when you have a, a connection with a company at, at any kind of friction point. Mm-hmm. Um, and that could be on Twitter or um, in support at an airport when you can't catch your flight or when you're, you know, it, it, you're on chat with a company and man, you could, you could take somebody's day and turn it into a delightful situation or a totally horrible situation. Mm-hmm. So that that's H to H. H to H is every human touch point that exists in a, in a company inside and out. Yep. It's in service of, of building a relationship instead of seeing the consumer as a transaction, like we mentioned before. And I would say to your point, um, people that run their companies uh, without transparency and not or you know it's the old way of doing things. So um, H to H is because it puts relationship at the center. It opens the possibility of what is it going to take to get into a relationship with these people, which requires listening and humor and empathy and vulnerability and all of the traits that make us human. So it, it's yeah. take take yeah. Uh, Amazon for example. They had this class act chat mm-hmm. building, and this one uh, chat. Uh, customer service rep from Amazon uh, because they've got data connected to the customer and he's logged in. They knew ahead of time, he knew ahead of time what product he wanted to return. And he said um, to him, uh, Oh, you know, he spoke in the, in the words of, Oh, the shall uh, not shall save the world. And, and uh, can I call you, um, Father, can, can I call you Father? Well, because his uh, name was Odin. Odin, and they went back and forth in the chat of speaking the language of the hollow of the book that he <laughs> wanted to get and did not get, and and the the guy was cracking up speaking the language. The customer that the service rep was actually doing this with him. They got him the book to make a long story short. But who does that? Um, <laughs> yeah, who's in the language of this book and, and says, Oh, thy Lord, we, we shall make, <laughs> and we will get you thy book and this will never happen. Like they will fix this immediately. And I mean, <laughs> I'm butchering it, but this is what actually went down. And this went viral because Amazon, this huge company allows for people to be human. Um, yeah. love or hate them. That that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that, that makes you feel special and unique and, and personal. So we have gotten so used to communicating globally with such ease. What if all of a sudden our entire power grid is permanently destroyed and we're without internet for months to a year? Would we even survive as a species? (laughs) Yes. And we might actually meet our neighbor. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean that this is this is the old days of community. That's the one thing human beings are we're we're built to crave connection, like Brian mentioned. So that means that we're always going to be trying to seek out our community because we also with that becomes a need for a sense of belonging to something, and oftentimes something bigger than ourselves. So we'll find the community. <laughs> it just uh, the internet takes away the need for proximity which is why it's kind of cool, right? Cause you can have friends all over the world and it doesn't matter. You can hire top talent from all over the world. So the need for proximity goes away, but I think it'd probably just return back to the old reliance on proximity yeah. for, for everything. <laughs> It'll feel so empty at first though. <laughs> yes, it would without Netflix. I don't know. That would be tough. <laughs> I'm walking around. I just envision the walking dead. 
you know, except <laughs> with less stabbing of people's brains. Less stabbing, <laughs> less brain eating. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> What's your favorite part about what you do now? Oh, man. <sighs> working with, um, working with people one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. um, versus working with, um, uh, working with a company and, and not really getting to see the effects of, of, mm -hmm. of um, the, uh, the, the work that we do. Not, not that I, I think that, um, you know, I want to, the impact that we make is, is like actually leaving smiles and, um, and I never got to see the smile, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so now that that's really gratifying seeing joy in other people and, and, and creating and helping them, helping to create joy in other people's lives. Yeah. Uh, that to me is just way more gratifying than um, seeing a 3% increase in a marketing email campaign or a um, <laughs> demand gen campaign. Not that again, that didn't raise, uh, you know, in our lifetime, we, we, I think we added up that we had um, helped companies create more than a billion dollars in sales across the board. And yet, Still, it gives me more joy to see a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, have, what have one person, joy. one person light up and have an aha. Yeah, and so yeah. that that gives me um, way more joy to see, and 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 I think they're creating um, more in their life. Uh, personally, this is I haven't verified this, but I think they they're creating more in their life now than what we were doing before because mm -hmm. it's just so much more. Um, um, meaningful, meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would say. Making a difference in people's lives, feeling like I'm making a difference in people's lives. So what's next, what's next for the two of you? <laughs> World domination. Oh, okay. <laughs> what's uh, well, the, I, I mean, I'll jump in, but I think, you know, we're, we're, as you know, you went through the accelerator and so the accelerator is our, um, our baby and we want to see mm -hmm. the accelerator continue to grow and help more people, mm -hmm. more people that are in uh, business owners and entrepreneurs that are, uh, you know, mo mostly service-based and startups that want to create uh, healthy businesses that are not burning out like I did and created proper healthier systems and structures and mm -hmm. brands and impacts, more impact in the world. Um, and, well, and, and I would add with purpose and clarity. Yeah. And then we want to take that and really help help them um, building and and create that that lifestyle that they want in their life without, mm -hmm. you know, with, and still be able to go on vacation and not have to check their email. So that's uh, that's our our main baby. Um, I, I think that there's a book left in in uh, me slash us. Um, Ooh. Either or, uh, we're not <laughs> sure yet. So um, that could be coming, and then. Um, and, and then we're still creative. So we've got our fingers in lots of different places for mm -hmm. consulting and, and other things that we do. Speaking, um, love to speak. I just will never speak 200 days and travel 200 days a year again. But thank you. Um, but, but, <laughs> uh, but I love speaking. And so, and I know Courtney loves to when I'm with her on the stage. So um, we, we, we like doing that. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for being here. It was so awesome to have the two of you. Well, thank you for inviting us. And it's always great to reconnect with you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's so wonderful to be here with you, Debbie. And um, I love just your, if I can just end this with your, just your vibrance and your creativity and how you show up in the world and, um, Thank you just for even having this show and being consistent with your show and having um, all these great people on and just for even inviting mm -hmm. us to be a part of, you know, one of your shows. It, yeah. It's really, um, really wonderful to be here. You got Moxie. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.